Hello everyone, welcome to Matchmaker Ventures GDPR webinar edition two on the 72 hour breach notification. Glad you all could join and find the time to listen in. We really appreciate it and we hope you get a lot out of us, a lot out of it. Last time we had a more of a grand overview over the regulation as such, the GDPR. This time we have more of a specific angle. We will look closer at the implications of the 70 two hour breach notification and as an expert on breaches and data breaches as such we have invited Daniel Söderberg CEO of Ion ID um, and we're very happy to have you Daniel hello thank you glad to be here um, I suggest before we kind of deep dive into the subject as such we will look at the agenda and how we go through the next 40 minutes so first I will start off to introduce um, our speaker, Daniel Söderbeck, and talk a bit about myself. Then I will give all the people who maybe who are for the first time uh, here a bit of context about Matchmaker Ventures and about what we do here. Um, and then afterwards we will deep dive into the subject itself, the 72 hour breach notification requirement. I will talk about more about the, give a legal basis then to expand on. And Daniel will also show you how you can proactively approach this topic. And afterwards we will have a brief Q and A session. Um, please use the Q and A function in the webinar solution to send us questions and don't hesitate to do so also at the beginning. We will then pick the question up at the end, questions up at the end and answer them. So about the speakers. Um, we're very happy to have Daniel Söderberg. He is um, the CEO of INID Group AB. Um, Daniel um, is a serial entrepreneur with a background in a variety of industries. He, for example, also co-founded Front Office Nordic AB which was recently listed on NGM Nordic MTF. Previously, he worked also in the commodity sector in the US uh, with a primary focus on oil and natural gas. And he has a very strong and broad background in the TV and especially in the last year in the tech sector. Um, my name is Christoph Prager. I'm the startup, en well, startup engagement manager at Matchmaker Ventures. I take care of our GDPR startups and thus also lead the GDPR focus area, which is uh, the host of today's webinar. Um, to tell you a bit about Matchmaker Ventures, I want to spend two minutes on our organization. Um, you see, what do we do? We bring two very separate or often separate parts of the business world together. We um, connect startups and corporates. We do that with, very, uh, with various offerings. One of the primary offerings we have is we work with our portfolio startups. Um, what we do with our portfolio startups is we help them in their sales and distribution processes. We do that via a global C-level network, which has about 50 senior level matchmakers who are distributed around the world. We um, work together with our startups to create a fast impact by connecting them to their customers, the corporates. Thus, we work mostly with uh, B2B startups or exclusively with B2B startups. This is an equity-free commitment, so we don't take any stakes, equity stakes in the startups, and we have a very hands-on, end-to-end approach from onboarding, validation, and also then the lifecycle management. Maybe a comment here, if you have any questions about Matchmaker Ventures, don't hesitate to send me an email, and um, I will gladly answer all the questions about what we do here. And this is also, again, also now the time to dive into the subject as such. So let's, let's talk about GDPR, Daniel. Yeah? Um, I already told you that our last webinar has had a more general approach to the subject. We covered um, not all of the aspects as the, the regulation itself is over 200 pages long, but we covered the most, uh, the, the most high level, at least, um, parts of the regulation. I show you again here, you can see on the slide is how we at Matchmaker Ventures kind of categorize the, the regulation as such. I don't want to go in too much detail on the different categories because that was mostly part of the last webinar. But what is interesting um, in the case of the 72 hour breach notification, that this um, notification requirement that GDPR now prescribes to organizations touches upon almost all of those areas, 
maybe we can exclude the consumer consent area, um, but you have to be ready in almost all of these areas to really being able to fulfill the requirements of the 72 out uh, breach notification. That's an important aspect, and this is also why this sometimes even seemingly straightforward requirement is more complex than it seems uh, at the beginning. So let's look at the, look at the, what the text says, basically. So the notification to the supervisory authority is mostly covered in Article 33 of the GDPR. There are also comments in the recitals 85 and 88. And what it states is that in case of a personal data breach, organizations are required to inform the supervisory authority without under delay and where feasible, no later than 72 hours after having become aware of it. What is also important that the notification as such has to include um, a lot of information. It has to include the nature of the personal data breach. It has to include the categories that were breached, the data categories, the number of data subject concerns. It has to also include the contact details, which is rather straightforward. But here again, then more, um, more not so straightforward, it has to include the likely consequences of the data breach and measures taken to address the personal data breach. Then there's also another requirement companies have to fulfill, which is more related to the customers. When do they have to inform the customers? Many people also mix those two requirements up. Um, so let's have a look at the next slide. Um, sorry. Yeah. So customer breach notification is dependent upon other factors. This is basically covered um, in Article 34 of the GDPR and recitals 86 and 87. So as it says there in Article 34, when a data breach is likely to result in a high risk to the rights and freedoms of natural persons, organizations have to communicate the data breach to the affected data subjects, thus their customers. So it's not, it's not necessarily a, crime, a requirement to inform your customers, like it is a requirement to, in every event of a data breach, to inform the supervisory authorities. There's a big difference. And even there's some more restriction to that communication requirement. Um, the communication of the breach to the data subject is even not required if the controller has implemented appropriate technical and organizational protection methods, e.g. encryption, pseudonymization, or even anonymization. So if it's, in this case, if it's not attributable, then via that breach to, uh, to a data subject as such. And the controller, in the other case, if the controller has taken steps so that the high risk is no longer likely to materialize. And then there's this negative restriction. If the, if the leak is of such disproportionate effort, then a public announcement is required, which has severe reputational consequences for the organization. Maybe a comment on both of these articles should be made that it applies to processes and controllers alike within the joint responsibility. That's an important um, aspect and also in, then makes also the processes to some extent uh, liable. And maybe the next best thing is to look at the pitfalls these, regular, these, uh, these two articles uh, impose. Um, because, as it, I said before, it may seem rather straightforward, but there are some, in the back there are a lot of things that have to be managed before such a breach notification requirement can be fulfilled uh, to the book, let's so to say. First of all, 72 hours is not a long time frame. Um, imagine the data breach occurs on a Friday and all was in the organization or just emergency staff is in the organizations. That gets reduced to basically 24 hours. Um, so you will have to have a, plan, a breach plan or a breach process in place even before anything happens. You should have it now already, <laughs> or you should have it before May 25th. And also the responsibilities need to be assigned accordingly. And as I said, all this needs to be in place before a potential breach. What is also important is um, that you know what personal data was breached. Mm -hmm. um, this relates to a centralization effort. So you should in advance know what kind of data you even have on the premises or IT premises 
of and systems of your company. For that, you need a data inventory or data centralization effort or process, um, which is um, not as straightforward as it seems and a big challenge. But um, maybe that's a small caveat. It is a requirement for GDPR in itself. So you will have to do that even before you have the breach notification process. Then um, another challenge is actually detecting a breach. This relates on, relates on the one hand to internal detection. So what kind of security and governance measures you have taken and also how, um, how aware the organization is of, of, these, uh, of these potential breaches and such and how often you audit then those systems as well. And then there's external detection. So finding a data in public. And there is a lot of, there are a lot of pitfalls uh, related to this external detection. These are all questions that Daniel will cover in a few minutes. Um, the last question is also, you should, is finding the data or knowing where the breach data is distributed. So this is not a specific task or requirement of the GDPR. But um, this is an important aspect you have to take into consideration because it deeply relates to the risk associated with the data breach. And as you've seen before, you need to assign a certain risk score or risk assessment, which you have then to communicate to the supervisory authorities. Yeah. And with those very dense and um, already <laughs> hopefully still enlightening or, yeah, not refreshing, hopefully enlightening um, information, I will gladly hand the floor to Daniel to take over and give us his view on the 72-hour breach notification requirement. Thank you. So we're going to jump in uh, a little bit more broader, I would say, to this topic. I think everyone who's been studying a little bit about GDPR understands that this is not something you do within a month and then you should be done with it. Um, but first of all, let's start about a little bit about INID for the people of you who don't know us, even though I think quite a few of you listening in today are aware of who we are and what we do. The company was founded in 2014. We are based off in Stockholm, Sweden, where we have our headquarter and we also have subsidiaries in Belgium and US. We are a listed company, even though we're small, but we're growing quickly. And that happened in September 16, and we are now uh, in the process of doing a global rollout or international, but I would say global. A mixed team of people, uh, everything from people ranging back from the Swedish military intelligence to secret police to techies to people who's done this journey before. And that's why we think we have a competent, a competent uh, group of people who can actually do this together. One comment before we move on is just to say that actually INID started working on implementing everything that is tied to GDPR already in March 2016. It means that we started really, really early because we understood that this is going to have a, a pretty big impact on what we do and especially on the customers or partners that we are working with which we definitely have learned lately, and we are glad that we started that early. So for the company who hasn't really started working with this, uh, I, I do understand that you have a lot on your table right now. But let's see if we can clear out a few things, and what I'm going to focus on today will be on the proactive part and measures that you actually can do, and I will also bring up a few pitfalls and some trends that we've been seeing lately. So. If we look on this and who is actually being affected of the GDPR, well, we have today at least 28 member states, even though we have a Brexit going on over in the UK. Uh, basically, every company who's doing business in the EU are actually affected of GDPR. And it's pretty interesting, though, because we tend to think that it's only the companies within the EU, but it's not. So everyone, every company who wants to make business in the EU will be affected, and we can see trends where a lot of Asian companies are now trying to do e-commerce over in Europe, and they will for sure be affected. If it's just as simple if they offer the prices in euros or even Swedish kroner, they will be affected. Uh, that is how hard GDPR is. We're talking about a half a billion people, which means there's quite a lot of GDP uh, involved in all those people. So there's a lot of money and a big market that you want to be in on. But there's a few things that I want to bring up. And, and, and I would say that's the scope of the whole GDPR and what actually changes. Um, I could have had a, a nice little picture saying power to the people, because that's actually what GDPR is all about. 
it's shifting now from from uh, having the companies having the control to actually the people and the individuals having the control. So basically, personal data shall mean any information relating to an identified or identifiable natural person. Person that means the data subject, and that's a word I might come back to. That's why I think it's important to know. But here's here's the kicker: personal data is owned by the individual, not the organization holding it. And that's the major change of GDPR. And it's pretty interesting because it has quite a big of an effect. And just talking about consent that you touched a little bit earlier here, uh, it's not that easy as you think, because even if the company thinks, well, I got consent from the user, uh, it means I've done my part. Well, that has to be, that's what you might think, but if the person as such didn't think that they got the, all the information, well, you're gonna be up for a review. Moving on, what does actually define the personal data? I think it's, it's uh, good to touch this uh, because it actually touched the area where we're in and all the data we actually find. So when you talk about personal data, you talk about things like name, address, birth date, IP address, which was not in scope before with the old DPD, uh, also mobile uh, devices IDs, in, order, in other words, MAC addresses, uh, even things like social media posted information. So if I go into Facebook and I say, hello, how are you? That's my data. Um, photographs. And I think the big runner up right now is the IoT who's collecting data. And that is a big change. And just to give you a good example, uh, one of the examples usually is, is your refrigerator. Well, saying that you have a picture of what's inside of the refrigerator. Well, that's data that's actually being sent over the internet. So of course, that's part of the GDPR. Uh, so that is, that is a big thing. The other part we talk, uh, the works I have to talk about is sensitive data. Basically information about your health, uh, ethnicity, uh, race, uh, philosoph <laughs> philosophical uh, beliefs, and of course your sexuality. And right now we have a pretty big discussion up when it comes to birth control, and that's of course sensitive data being sent over the internet. And yes, to understand why uh, sen uh, sensitive data is, is in its own category, that's also part of saying that you need in as a company uh, to have a DPO, basically a person working with this, making sure that the company itself is following all the regulations, even though you're a smaller organization. So it means that a lot of, of uh, companies, I would say startups, uh, that might be really, really small and definitely don't have the, the budget for it, might be affected because they're working with sensitive data, which means they actually have a need to have a person uh, that's gone through, I would say, the education of GDPR and being certified as well uh, as um, handling all the DPO questions, data protection officers for, for the people don't know. And of course, you have the genetic biometric data, fingerprints, facial recognition, retina scans, and, and gene sequences. And I think we're gonna see more on the, in the bio um, field the gene se sequences coming up more and more, which is a big topic. So we can see a lot of, of startups within that area. But of course, all the information is being uh, stored. And I saw that the um, I think it was the government in, in India who has the biggest database of, of biometrics went out and said maybe this is not that good that we have all this information. So so changes are are coming for sure. So <clears throat> what are the two things? We, we touched it a little bit earlier when we talked, uh, but I wanna emphasize a few things. Uh, we talk about you know, having three days to, to inform once uh, you've been part of a breach, or actually once you have got the information that you've been part of a brief, uh, breach or find it yourself, because that's two different things. But I, uh, I would say I made it in bold the comment about where feasible. And this is actually a pretty big uh, uh, thing because we're probably going to see quite a few uh, companies arguing for it wasn't feasible for us to notify. <clears throat> and I'm sure of it. And it actually leaves uh, a little bit of the tooth out of you know, the whole 72 hours notification period, where it opens up for, for discussion. And naturally, this will be interesting to see once it's being tested in court, because we can be sure that it will be tested. And that's one thing. The other part that I also want to bring up is the second paragraph. Unless the personal data breach is unlikely to result in a risk to the rights and freedom of a natural person. Well, that actually doesn't say power to the people. It actually says vice versa. It gives the control actually to the company in order to challenge, uh, I would say, the whole 72-hour uh, 
breach notification. So that is also a little bit of an opening uh, where I see that it's going to be challenged. And of course, we're going to have to wait until the first court decision comes out. And then we'll know how they will interpret this and how hard they will be on it. <clears throat> so here's the big thing. This is the scary thing. This is what we see in the news all the time. It's the 20 million euros or 4% of the total worldwide annual turnover in the fiscal year, whichever is higher. So <clears throat> I think the reason for, for the whole, all the seminars that, that matchmakers are doing right now, and I think uh, in, in the, the work that we are doing here is to see what can we do to lower that amount. I think that's the whole key. How can we do and how can a company make sure that we can come down all the way down to a written warning? Because the fact is it starts from a written warning all the way up to the 20 million or the 4%. And I think that's why we're taking all the measurements we are doing right now. And I think the key is to be as prepared as po possible and proactive as possible. I think those are the key elements uh, in order to get it down. You need to get your things together. Otherwise, you're going to have a problem because there's a lot of things you want to do. But on the other hand, if you have done so, done everything you possibly can in following the regulations, well, it's probably not that uh, um, the chances for you of getting the 4% of the 20 million is probably not that high because you can show that you have actually taken all, every precaution that you possibly can. And that means everything from the technical security from developing, uh, whenever you're developing with this in mind, uh, which is designed, designed by it. So I think uh, there's a lot of things you can do to it. Uh, when we look at IONID, we're doing a few things. I would definitely not saying, hey, you know, if you have IONID, you will be covered for everything because GDPR is so complex. And there's also quite a lot of, of, of uh, question marks in there because GDPR hasn't been implemented yet, and until it's been implemented and we we'll see the first court rulings, we will know. And these are some of the things I'm going to question now. And I'm also going to leave it open for you to think about. So if you look on what we do uh, on IONID, well, um, we basically work for, for looking for leaked information. And why do we do that? Well, the problem we have today is the rapid digitalization uh, Basically, that drives everything right now. Everything is becoming digital, and we're using a lot of data in order to be better and better in what we're doing. So there's also, because of this, uh, it also means that security many times comes as a second thing. Uh, and I, I tend to say always, think of it like this. If you have a startup and you only have this much money that you can put into it, you're probably going to put it into technology first and then security second. And that's what we're foreseeing. And it, it also goes for bigger companies, everything from banks to, to uh, I would say, insurance companies, et cetera, where they're doing different projects. And unfortunately, the security doesn't always come first in priority. So that drives it. And, and the result of not having everything in place and detecting things is that the average time to actually discover you know, uh, either an either theft or fraud is 201 days. It's gone down a little bit. I saw a new report saying 196 or something like that. But it's way off the three days that you actually have to report it. So we should be scared. I mean, this is a, this is a huge problem. We see it every day, new leaks coming out. Uh, and we're we 100 percent sure that, that the affected company has no idea that it's out there. But there are some question marks that we're going to come back to. So just talking about the breaches, usually these are the ones you see. You see all the big, scary ones, the major big breaches. Well, I think. Here's the thing that you have to think about. You know, these comes out from time to time. But every day, there are several smaller leaks that comes out. They're popping out pretty much, I would say, within at least every hour, but I would say several in an hour. But they are smaller. They are not the major one. They are not the one, you know, reaching the headlines. They are not the one part of the 4,149 publicly uh, uh, disclosed leaks because those are the ones being reported in. Either they're being reported in by the company themselves or because they have been you know, brought up by a newspaper and they've had to disclose it, which means that it's come into statistics. You know, the, the, the gray area here is that there's so many more leaks that people have no idea of. And, and you have to question also, there's a lot of question marks to those, but there's so much information that's floating out there, um, which is actually a big, big problem because we see them all the time. And also just a comment about the, the 
money here, and that's actually before GDPR come in play. So a lot of that is also reputational damage. So you can imagine what is going to happen with these figures now once uh, GDPR is coming in place. They are going to pop up. So quickly, what do we do in IND group? So we basically search uh, both automatically and of course manual for leaked information. Uh, we search in the public net, we search in the dark net. I mean, we search in different data points where we believe that we can find data which shouldn't be, that is tied to you as an individual or a company. All the data we collect, because of course naturally becomes quite a lot of data, uh, we go through it and we analyze the information and we risk assess it. And <clears throat> here I want to stop a little bit because the analyzing is the big thing here. And it's going to be even more challenging uh, and important uh, when GDPR comes into play. And the reason why I'm stopping here is that there's a lot of data coming out, or I would say breaches coming out, where they name the breach coming from a certain company. But the fact is, it might not even be from that company. Uh, in this world, there's a lot of people who want to reach fame, uh, so they might say, hey, I got a thousand you know, accounts for Spotify. But it wasn't actually Spotify getting breached. And a good example was Mark Zuckerberg when they said that his Twitter account had been breached. It wasn't breach, it was from another breach where they took his credentials and basically did credential stuffing and tested it on Twitter and they got in and actually two other accounts as well, which they really didn't talk about. Um, so that's how they got in. So in fact, Twitter wasn't breached, uh, although uh, Twitter has been breached. So, but in that case, it wasn't. And that's uh, where I would say in our field of what we do is it's for something that we even have to be even better on. So when we're analyzing, we do it both automatically and manually, and if our system can't really figure out what it is, it goes to the manual processor who will actually go through the information in order to reach the best, the best qualified analysts uh, on, on that particular breach or information that we have found. Once we have analyzed the data, we actually store the data. And, and I want to be clear and also bring up here that, that we structure the data, but we encrypt and hash all the information that we find. And the reason why I'm bringing this up is also just preventing a few questions from coming up a little bit later, is that by doing this, we actually don't know what kind of data we have, uh, where it's stored. So when we look at that, it's hashed out data, meaning that we collect all data. We do not search for a certain individual. We bring in all the data and we structure it and we hash it out. So it means, in, in other words, that we don't go one-on-one. -on -one. That's forensic work. Uh, and the, the, I would say companies working with forensic uh, are going to have some problems, especially in EU. In the US, a little bit different because you can apply for different licenses, so you're actually allowed to do it. But in EU, you will have a problem. It will also become a, a, quite a big problem for a lot of the security departments trying to do things like this. Uh, around in Europe uh, because there's certain things you can do or allowed to do and not to do. Uh, what we do, we work with alarm system and that comes down to the next point number four is that the, what we do is that we're letting our customer register the object that we are going to surveil, which could be anything from a company name, organizational number, to an individual's SSN, to a, a credential, to a credit card, etc. And that is also, of course, being encrypted and hashed out, which means that once we get them in or they register it, we don't see the information in clear text. So what we do is matching the hashes, in other words. So we're going blind and blind and see if we have a match to give that information back. So once we have gotten a hit, we will inform the customer. And if you are a company and we would have a hit, you'll get the information that we found the information that's leaked. If it's on the company name, it might be actually a full breach. So it looks a little bit different. Moving on, <clears throat> we have two products. Yes, uh, doing a little bit of commercial uh, about ourselves and what we do. We have Ion Pass and we have Ion ID. Um, if we start off with um, Ion Pass, uh, we do the following. So, Ion Pass is a product that we made for companies still using email and password to log in. It's funny when I say still use because we're going to do that for many years. There's a lot of questioning saying, hey, you know, isn't this all changing by using you know, two FAs or using a two FA still email and password, but using you know, uh, biometrics, etc. But you have to be aware, yes, such a thing like two FA. Uh, I mean, Google, you know, brought that in years ago on, on their Gmail account, and they're still up. I don't know if they're even up over 30%. So 
it takes time. You know, technology goes fast, but things like this takes time. And also, uh, it looks different in different countries. And if you are a company trying to go global, uh, you need to find a way for, for letting people log in or register, uh, which works for every country wherever they are. And that also becomes a little bit tricky if you're not going country by country. So what we do in this case is that we offer our customers an API. It's actually three-folded because there are three different APIs you can use in this case. And they use it for registration and login for the customers when they're using email and passwords. Uh, every time someone trying to register a new customer or user, it will do a check against our breach database. And again, it will be encrypted and hashed out, meaning again, we're not doing anything in clear text. We have no idea what information they're testing. It could be anything, basically. And, but if they get a match, we have already, uh, from our side, uh, done um, analyze the information, and they will get also to back, uh, back a risk assessment. So if you log in or register to a site, and it's been part of a breach, we'll send you back a one to four, depending on how high it is. It might be a password that we found 26 times in different breaches. It will, of course, be a high, which means that the company can uh, force the user trying to register to use another password. So they get a nice, clean set of passwords in their um, database. We can also cross-combine it, so we actually test the email and password together, again, in one hash, in order to make sure. And then we know to 100% that this information has been breached. Uh, and we actually do something a little bit regarding phishing. So we actually, uh, the third thing that we are setting up on Ion Pass as right off right now we're doing. So we can actually check the name at, and then we can check all the domains so we can see if it's going to be part of something else. And the second thing is, of course, on logins. As I said previously, breaches are going on all the time. We find them all the time, which means you're not safe because you registered a new password, for instance, on this site. Because you know, five minutes afterwards you registered, we might find a breach where it's in, this new one that you might have used somewhere else before. So of course, every time someone logs in, we do this, you know, continuously the same check. That's what the company does. And the information they get back is actually, just to be clear on this, it's the company getting the answer back, not the user. So this is something that happens in behind, basically. So it's a way of, of uh, uh, avoiding credential stuffing. But why is this important for GDPR? Well, think of it this way. If we would have found a breach uh, that is coming from this particular company is using our service where they have leaked all the usernames and passwords. We found it, we implemented it in our database. They will have a 100% hit rate every time someone logs in. So they will for sure be notified and know that they've been part of a breach. So it's a nice way of getting the signal directly because suddenly every customer they have, are not, you know, when they're trying to log in, they're going to get an information that that usernames and password has been part of a breach, which they didn't have previously. So that's how you can use Ion Pass from a GDPR perspective. And basically what it means, you get the information, the first notification, so you can act, so you have a possibility within the 72 hours. Uh, before moving on, oh, we can actually move on to our, our other product, and that's Ion ID. <clears throat> if you look on Ion ID, what we do, and this again, identity, what we, we're trying to do here, this is where we work together with partners. And a partner could be for us a bank or insurance company uh, or yeah, pretty much anyone who has other customers. Uh, and in this case, it would be a B2B2B uh, sort of partnership where they are offering our service to their business companies. So let uh, customers. So let's take an insurance company and what they could do is that they would offer our service as part of the insurance to their business companies which means that those companies could add the information regarding themselves to be surveyed. For instance, their company name, their um, company registration number, uh, and of course, individual information as well. And of course, once we get a hit and find the information, we will warn them back. So they get like a first uh, uh, response back from us. And what this does, and I think everything IONID does, is giving them a glimpse, because we're searching the net, and this is where most of the companies have the problem. Really good of internal security, but have no idea on what's going on out there. Uh, so, so I would say this is, again, a warning system, and this is how it should be used. Because here's, here's the thing you have to think about. What if you get information, and if you are a DPO or you're the, the, uh, the company, 
you get uh, information from an email, say from someone saying, hey, you know, I found all the information being breached here uh, on an internet site. Uh, you should act on it. You get the information and you act on it. But later it shows, uh, when they do the investigation, that that information about your breach and all that data has actually been out there on the internet for 201 days. The question you have to ask yourself, where do you think you will be on the penalty levels? Will it be just a warning or will it be higher? So part of what we're trying to do is give you the first you know, notification so you can act upon that. That's the key to all of the products of what we are doing on INID. And that's how you should also look on those products on what we're doing from us. Last but not least, uh, we've gone through this ourselves. So we see ourselves as GDPR compliant. We are getting heavily tested nationally from our partners, which is a good exercise. Uh, but we feel we have done a really, really good work on how we set up everything. Uh, and also we are PCI DSS compliant. I think if you are PCI DSS compliant, you've done quite a lot that touches GDPR because you need to have a lot of things uh, already prepared in, in case of an accident and how you're dealing with sensitive data, et cetera, et cetera. Um, that's about us and um, what I have to say. So I think we're gonna open up for today, correct? Yes, thank you, Daniel, for the great talk and for all the information also on how you can help to uh, proactively approach that requirement. Um, we have still have a few minutes left um, to um, ask the questions. I would ask everyone who has a question to use the Q&A function in the webinar solution and to send, this, send us in the, the questions via that, um, why that way, by uh, typing it in. We'll then try to answer all the questions which come in. But maybe before they come in, we have a few of them already, but before we start, maybe Daniel, you've gone through the whole um, becoming compliant process. You have a lot of experience in that. You, you are engaged with that topic, GDPR, uh, all the time. So can you give us your overall assessment and you know a bit of uh, an outlook to what will happen after May 25th, 2018? What do you expect? In terms of yeah. I think we're gonna see uh, when this is being implemented I think we fairly soon or quite quick to it are gonna see the first cases because pretty much all of Europe you know all the, the countries and, and I would say also all the national uh, entities that are, are basically authorities uh, handling this want to see where we're going how hard are they gonna actually be in this so I think we're gonna see a few cases tested and it's going to go quite quick. It wouldn't surprise me if they're already looking into a few cases so they can actually uh, get some, some court rulings on it so they know what's going to happen. I think also uh, a big challenge here is for the uh, authorities in each country because there's a lot of questions. I mean, anyone can basically uh, uh, go to the authority as an individual mm -hmm. to, to complain that you know, this company has used my data in, in, in the wrong way. So I know for in Sweden, for instance, uh, I heard that they are employing massive amounts of people right now in order to be able to cope with this. So I'm, I, I'm pretty sure we're gonna see delays, we're gonna see problems if it goes to that. We're also gonna probably see some, uh, because of course you don't have to say who you are when you're doing this, uh, but you probably should because also the authorities has, have to inform you how they're proceeding uh, with an ongoing case. So it's going to be a lot of work, uh, that's for sure. Uh, just a, a comment also, I, I've heard, you know, people saying that, um, you know, yes, yes be, uh, be uh, clear on the consent with the users, then you mm -hmm. should be home free. Uh, no, that's not true. Uh, I recommend to actually go through the GDPR to start checking it, because there's quite a lot of, of uh, uh, quite a lot more you need to do. Just the fact that you can, can ask yourself whether or not the consent was given or not, that's a problem. Yeah, it's also only the legal basis and it's just the, the basis for starting even the processing and mm -hmm. starting the, many of the other use cases. Mm -hmm. Maybe an important point you stressed in terms when you said that um, um, some organizations may not even be responsible for some of the leaks because of credential stuffing, and maybe you can explain this yeah. to people also what this means, actually. Yeah. Um, uh, have had a breach without being breached themselves. Mm -hmm. So how can you determine that the leak of information 
that you have found is actually tied to a specific company? Can you maybe comment on that? It was really interesting. I, uh, I think I think this is the big challenge for us working in this uh, business, and that that's why I emphasize is that the analyzing is going to be even more uh, important uh, coming up. Uh, here's the, one of the trends we're seeing right now is there's a lot of huge leaks of credential testing material, basically meaning that the leaks are just containing email and password and clear text, which mm -hmm. is exactly what you're looking for. This means that what happens once those comes out, there's a lot of people, and you don't have to be a hacker, uh, that is actually testing the information to see how many accounts can they get on a certain site, and then mm -hmm. they actually publish that information which means that the site itself hasn't been part of a breach. It, it actually means, yes, that, that someone has ev not even hacked it, uh, just tried the information, got access to the accounts, and that's yes, you know, either selling it, you know, if, it, if it's uh, sites like Spotify or Netflix and those or Uber, they'll just resell it again, uh, or just putting it out there to become a little bit famous, I would say. Mm -hmm. so, so you need to be even better on analyzing. But again, this is also a reason why you want to get the information fast as a company, because the last thing you don't want to uh, be in is the first line of the, uh, oh, the first page of the newspaper. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> yeah. Um, maybe one question from, uh, sorry, yeah, there's a question coming in thick and fast. Uh, yeah. yeah. Uh, you, there's a question about how your products fit banks and insurance companies. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. And has it been in the reviews uh, from banks and insurance companies? Uh, what are their views on, on your product? I think, I think it's, it's a fair question. It fe feels like it's more of a, of a shareholders kind of question, <laughs> but fair enough. Uh, we'll go on that as well. Um, we are out there talking to, to quite a lot of banks and insurance companies, as uh, quite a few of you know. And naturally, we have uh, been going through everything from does our product fit to are we compliant, etc. Uh, on the compliant part, uh, as as many of you know, so listening, we have signed a global uh, deal with a global telco, and uh, naturally, we've gone through the process with them as well. And when it comes to our product, if it fits or not, well, again, it's up naturally to the bank and insurance company to look at that. But if you look a little bit on what's going on in the U.S., you can see that quite a few of I would say both banks and, and uh, insurance companies have this uh, kind of, of uh, service uh, included, working with companies like us for actually getting it out there. So I would say, because you have to ask yourself, what kind of, let's call it fintech or secure tech uh, services can they add to their product portfolio? And at the same time, think that every bank and insurance company are screaming right now for more products and services makes them stand out and also a way to gain more new revenue or strengthen their own package. Because pretty much if you go to an insurance company, you will see that their insurances look exactly the same, all of them. There's no difference. The price is different, uh, but it's the same thing. And the same goes for the, for the banks, especially the bigger banks. It's the same thing. So they want to stand out, but they also want to let their customers feel more secure. So the uh, information we received so far from them back has been, <laughs> it's been good. <laughs> That's pretty much what I oh, that's good. allowed that's to say. Yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, I mean, that, well, let's pick the last question, Daniel. I think we're running out of time already. Yeah. Yeah. Um, sure. Yeah. The question is here from a user is um, how does the search function work of INID? So is there is a search upon request or is there, how does that work? Can you expand a bit on that? That's a question. Yeah. No, I, I think. Uh, it's important to know, and I said a little bit previous in, in my presentation, that when it comes to search, we don't do individual search. And I think that's really, really important. Uh, so basically, if you would, uh, now we're talking about GDPR, but, but if you take as a person and you add your social security number, uh, we don't go out particularly searching for that um, social security number. We search for all data. Oh, okay. Within yeah. EU, without outside of EU, etc. So basically, you could see it as bulk, and that's also part of many times of the breaches because we don't know. Because again, we encrypt and hash it out directly when when we analyzed it, in order to make sure that that we don't have it and do the one to one, mm -hmm. which is typically what you do when you are working in within the forensic field. I would say, yeah. let's say, investigation to breach, which 
the company has to do if they've been part of, of the breach in order to fulfill the requirements of GDPR when they were reporting it in. So I think that's that's the major uh, difference. So we go with bulk volume, mm -hmm. and then we do uh, basically hash against hash, anemonous against anemonous, and then we'll take it from there. Okay. It looks like we have a perfect landing towards 45 minutes. Huh? Um, so we have to wrap it up. Sadly, there are some open questions, but we, um, are, I think Daniel is happy to that you get in touch, yeah, and yeah. also answer anything regarding their company. You, know, you want to just take one more? Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. 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 Sure. Please. Yeah. That one. Yeah. So where should the consent request be placed for a company with both cloud and client location service? Yeah. Uh, first of all, I'm not a lawyer, just to point that out. But, but I think it's an important uh, topic because, again, when it comes to GDPR, uh, if you have a cloud provider, the GDPR affects them as well. And you touched it a little bit earlier. Yeah. So I think definitely that that's uh, very important. And in this case, uh, to answer it is that if you have the services out there, you are the ones that need to seek the consent, but you need to inform the user or buyer or whatever it might be regarding also how you're using that information. If you're using a cloud provider, who's doing what with that data? Yeah. The, the whole idea with the consent now is that it's not just enough to, to uh, put the information out there you know, a lot, with a lot of different information. It has to be very, very clear of what you're gonna do and how you're gonna use that data and where it's gonna be stored, et cetera. And that's the big difference, and that's why, why I challenge the whole you know, consent thing, that you have to be so clear on how you're gonna be using that data. And it's part of it, the recommendation is always like, less is more. You know, if you need the birth uh, control, depend, you know, checking on, on <laughs> not birth control, but if you need to check on if a person is over, let's say 16, mm -hmm. uh, it's a little bit different in different countries because there are, uh, exceptions in that rule as well yeah um, you know you can ask for when they were uh, born but you don't have to store the information yeah um, I mean the consent I, I think the consent is a whole another topic yeah uh, we, which we will touch upon in the in another webinar which I will uh, which I'm inviting you all to join next time um, the last thing which is left to say is say thank you Daniel for taking the time for giving you the insights on also on your product and your your experience thanks for that thank you and thank you everyone for tuning in um we'll keep you all informed about what's going on with our webinar series and everything else thanks again for joining and uh, wish you all a great day bye bye